Hello everybody, my name is Ragos and this is Colorful Coding. This is the second part of our AR4 tutorial. And what we are going to do today is create a really low resolution scanner using AR4. And why are we going to start with this is because we are going to use the base concept of every markerless AR experience, which is feature points. Feature points get scanned and located exactly in the space and then they create a point cloud together. A point cloud is a set of data points in space. Point clouds were really important for 3D scanners, but more recently they can be produced by an RGB camera alone. They are really important, especially when doing SLAM techniques. SLAM is simultaneously location and mapping. There are many algorithms that do that and their purpose is to map the area around you and also locate the camera inside it. It's basically what AR Core does, what HoloLens and Magic Leap do, or even your intelligent vacuum cleaner. Therefore, most of the features of AR Core are created over this point cloud scan they do. Once we have the point cloud and the camera pose, we can do a lot of things and right now we're going to do just a basic low resolution 3D scanner as to visualize what AR Core is actually seeing behind the doors. Once having those points, more advanced features are open to us such as plane detection, anchor creation and anchor sharing and uh, so on. The example today is made in SynForm on Android. Uh, SynForm is just a layer over OpenGL. I'm not going to go into details since I want this to be just for clear for understanding so much focus on Android. There's even a chance on the future tutorials we are going to go in Unity so we can visualize even better our data. However, I decided to start like this because writing code for everything we do is more explicit than the workflow from Unity where we create game objects and create dependencies and so on. I just think it's much easier to start on Android and then migrate on Unity. Also, this video is going to focus on some bits of code. You will, however, be able to find the whole code on GitHub. I'll leave a link for it. You are free to download it, try it, and ask questions if something is unclear. Getting started. To get started and set up the environment, there are lots of really good tutorials out there, so I'm not going to go into it. Instead, I'm going to leave some links down there and wait for you to do the setup on whatever environment you wish to work in. I actually did follow some tutorials to do the setup on Android. The only change I made was to put Synform on the 1.6.0 version and not uh, the one in the tutorial. That's the single thing I did differently there. So go ahead, I'm waiting here. Okay, so now we have AR Core all set up and let's have a look on what it has to offer. So on Android, everything is inside the AR fragment. On Unity, you can find everything using Google AR Core in the script. AR Core has mostly everything encapsulated in one big object. It doesn't matter where you use it, they're usually the same. So what you have to know right now is that AR Core has two big objects in which it stores the data and from which you can take them. At first, you have the session. A session manages AR system state and handles the session lifecycle. This class is the main entry point to the AR Core API. This class allows the user to create a session, configure it, state it, state it, and most importantly, receive frames. So that's what the documentation tells us about it. Basically, that the session is the biggest object, it has the most data in it. It encapsulates the frames, which are really important, and uh, you can actually resume, start all those events that are general about AR Core. More importantly, we have to wrap our minds around the AR frames. You can see a frame as a snapshot of the data you have at a certain time. Whatever is ever changing can find on the AR frame. Whenever we think about the query of the same data, if we think it's changing all the time, we can just find it there. For instance, on the AR frame, we can find the camera pose, we can find the trackables. A trackable can be either a point or a plane. Planes can be horizontal and vertical for now. From the camera, we can also acquire the image it has. We will actually do this today, acquiring the point cloud. Okay, so now we understood these two concepts of AR4, let's look a bit how to start a 3D scanner. So what we are going to do with this 3D scanner is that we're going to take the point cloud from AR4, we're going to find out the position of every point in it, and we are also going to find the color of every point, and then store it in a JSON or a similar file, and we can visualize it later in Unity. It's very simplistic, but we're going to prove some points. It's pretty clear for us that we can acquire the point cloud from the frame, since the point cloud is changing with time. Here on Android, we can find the airframe inside the, the main fragment in the AR scene view. However, on Unity, it should be something similar. And once we have the frame, the object looks pretty much the same. Remember, frame is just a state in a point of time. So after you have this and the update method is called, this uh, buffer will change and the point cloud can be totally different. If we look inside this point cloud, we can see it has a few interesting properties. There's a timestamp 
It has uh, some IDs and it also has the actual coins that are uh, stored inside the float buffer. The float buffer is just an array of floats that has pairs of four floats, where the first three means the XYZ position, while the fourth one is the response or the confidence score of that point. So once we have that, we will just have to get the points with the method get points and then copy the information from that buffer to our array or this. Objects. So now we have an array with all the points in the exact position they should be and if you export it and view it in a 3D viewer you could actually see those points and the shape they are inside the rapport. Do not forget, once you finish your job with the float buffer, don't forget to release it. This is very important, otherwise we're going to have a resource exhausted exception which actually tells you that you cannot acquire more than n points but that buffer is just going to overflow basically. And with most resources we get from the frame, we have to take them and then release them back. So it's pretty simple what we did until now. We acquired the point cloud, we actually got it out of the float buffer, we saved it in our own array and then released the point cloud. Now that we have the data, let's talk about visualizing it. Quite what we would think of, it's not that easy to actually visualize the point cloud. I've been looking for something to enable the live visualizing of the point cloud and it's not out there. However, there's this guy on GitHub. Actually, he made a form from a young boy. He created his own class named the point cloud node. You have the link down there in the description. I basically copy pasted everything in my own class and you can also take it from my GitHub. And then all we have to do is create a node, add that node as a child inside the scene. Nodes are how we put things into the scene. There are many types of nodes, there are anchor nodes. This actually happens when we hit any kind of trackable and we want to anchor our 3D object of that trackable so it stays stick basically by that object. And we also have transformable nodes that accept transformation, rotation, uh, translation, scaling up. Every time we work with 3D, we have a scene, the parent of a whole 3D objects hierarchy. Why is it a hierarchy? Because that every object is parented to another object or by the scene itself. A parent can actually control the translation, rotation and scale of its children. That's why whenever we create a node, no matter what type it is, we have to parent it of something or by the scene itself. So going back now to the point of node, we basically create one and parent it to the scene. We put it out there and after that we just call the method update with the new point cloud every time our scene updates. This actually is called every frame. As you know in games you have the frame per second how every game is actually a big loop where everything happens as fast as they can and this is how we call the update function here if you're familiar with 3d engines like unity it's actually one of the main methods you put the code in so as often as we can we take the new point cloud from our core and we put it inside the node that is already created in the new position now if you start the application you can actually see blue pyramids appearing on every feature point and you can see how many they are and how often they update themselves it's quite interesting because it's quite close of how a mixed reality headset works so that's where you see actually how powerful this SDK is so now you can go further but if you actually open the class we copy pasted right now you can see some really interesting stuff you can learn how to create a model from not from just vertices and edges through code without using an external obj model <laughs> So now we debugged it, we've seen what points we are saving, but uh, let's talk about optimization. Optimization. If you right now put the application on your phone, you will see it's going kind of bad. Also, it covers a lot of memory and that's a pretty bad thing. And why this happens is because on each frame we put the same feature points in the array even though they are in the same position. So what we will do, every time we want to put a new point inside our uh, array, we are going to see there's not another point nearby. We can use something like a centimeter or something like this. And for calculating the distance, we are going to use the Euclidean distance formula. It's exactly what you learned in high school. It's what we use in 3D space to calculate distances. And it's not hard to use. You can actually furtherly optimize it by creating small arrays based on each cubic meter or something like this and compare our point with just the points that should be around. I haven't done this since the application was working fine on my phone, but I strongly encourage you to try it. So now that we have the point cloud, let's talk about the color. What we have to do is knowing where a point is in 3D to see where is it on our 2D screen. This is something called the world to screen position. In the 3D engines like Unity is already implemented, but since it's really interesting, we're going to talk a bit about it. The first thing we have to do is acquire the image from the camera. So it's pretty straightforward line of code. We're going to take our camera image from the frame since exactly like the point cloud, it's something that changes through time. So we just have to take the frame and acquire 
acquire the camera image. Have you observed we actually used again the word acquire? This means after we use the image, we have to release it. Otherwise, we're going to have a resource exhausted exception, just like in the case of point clouds. So now we have the 2D image. All we have to do is get the world to screen position, then put that color on our 3D object and it's ready to export. World to screen position. So Unity already has this and it's mostly what happens inside OpenGL once we create our geometry and try to see how it is projected on our 2D screen. However, in Android it's not that easy to do, but we're going to do it by hand and explain it here. What? That's the evilest thing I can imagine! Oh, all you can do is write it with the best you know how and... All you have to do is actually search it over Google and we found it inside an answer on Stack Overflow. And I also linked that there, but it's really great to understand it since it has some really interesting points there. Okay, so once we have our point in 3D, we, all we need to do is get it and in our screen position basically, in two dimensions. Basically what you have to do is multiply the camera projection matrix by camera view matrix and by the position of our object and then convert the X and Y from clip space to screen space. There are lots of words here and uh, even if in the end you don't understand all of them, don't worry. Also, matrix operations are highly parallelizable. If we have more threads, we can work faster. That's why the GPU is important, that it have lots of threads. It's really good on doing parallel jobs. It's much better than the CPU on doing this. Basically, the GPU works by multiplying and uh, adding matrices. So if you have to put the object position vector in its place and then get the view matrix and projection matrix from the camera. AR4 gives us uh, the intrinsics of the camera and this, also these matrices and lets us work with them. So they're pretty easy to acquire from AR4. What the view matrix is, it's the inverse of the transformation matrix. The transformation matrix is the actual position and rotation of the camera. The view matrix is its inverse. So instead of actually moving the camera inside the world, we want to move the whole world in an inverse way and see how to project that on the screen. The projection matrix, uh, in a simplistic way, tries to compensate for the projection uh, deformation. And uh, it's a bit more interesting than that, but, but I will leave interesting links about it. So once we acquire those, we have to take from clip space to window space our points and then return them. I know it's a fast forward way to explain this process. I just want to make you a bit uh, familiar with, with the fact that behind the screens everything is just matrices and multiplication of matrices. So yeah, the mathematics of each of these are a bit more complicated, but they're not as hard as they seem. It's uh, more of a glimpse on how things are done. If you use a 3D engine, usually you already have it, but the scene for instance, doesn't offer it out of the box. Once we have the screen projection, we just have to make sure it's actually on inside our screen. If it's negative or outside of it, we just have to discard our feature points and store only those that have color. So now that we have the 3D position of our point inside the point on and the 2D position on the image, we just have to take the color from there. Uh, disclaimer, if you are on Android, you will not get an RGB image, but then why UV? But since this is an Android specific tutorial, I'm just going to say I did the convert the image inside the code. You can see this in the function image to bitmap. You can read more about it there. In the end, everything is stored inside the JSON. And what I did was create a small Unity project just to see if it looks right, but you can do whatever you want with your data. Conclusion. Okay, so now we kind of dive into spatial mapping. We've seen how it works and what the point cloud is, how many points are actually detected by our core, how to debug it. We have understood that everything is inside the session and uh, all the data is stored inside AR frames and throughout these two objects you can do lots of fun stuff. I also had a small off-topic talk about how 3D data is actually put in a 2D manner on the screen. And when I'm with friends, I like to have fun, 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 fun. We might pretty soon go to Unity because we have more power there and we have many functions already implemented. By the way, there's a new Air Core version out and you can now also uh, augment faces and you have lots of points detected through the API and I encourage you to look into it. We are also going to look into it sometime after we go deeper into AR4. On the next one, I think we will play with planes. Hope you liked it. Please subscribe. If you have any question about what I'm presenting or about the code on GitHub, please leave a message or a comment and I'm going to try and answer it. And uh, yeah, see you next time.